The purpose of this video is to focus on the movie display object. The, the movie display object can be added to any experiment by taking it from the toolbox on the left hand side of the screen here and adding it to any part of your experiment just by dragging and dropping it like this. Now by default the name will be called movie display 1. We recommend changing these names to match the function of the object. So if this for example will be used to display the stimulus in your experiment, go ahead and rename this by right clicking and click on rename or clicking F2 and calling this stim movie. You can change the name to whatever you want as long as you remember it later. Now double click on the movie display object to see its properties in the workspace. Now unlike the slide object, the movie display object can only be used to display one movie at a time. And you can change all of the properties associated with the movie along with its size in the properties page by clicking on the properties page icon in the left hand corner. Now the first tab is all about all of the different properties of the movie itself. The first property is the file name. The file name property here lets you determine what movie you're going to load into this movie display object. You can do that by either directly referencing a movie by clicking on this folder and finding a movie that you like. So for example, we have one here in the samples folder for E prime three. We have box cylinder face and perception by default, and you can simply load it into your movie display object by double clicking on the movie file that you like, and it auto formats the link here for you. You can also reference a movie via attribute reference. Or you could also reference the movie if it's in the same folder by just typing the name of the movie followed by its extension. So something like that. You can then determine where in the movie we're starting and stopping playback. We're determining if there is a back color for any area behind the movie and what color it is and if the back is opaque or if it's transparent, if you can see behind the movie. The stop after property allows you to determine if the entirety of this movie display object stops after the movie stops or does it simply pause in the last frame. The stop after mode allows you to determine where the movie is stopping, so either the offset time of this object or the onset time of the next object. The stretch property allows you to stretch the size of the movie both along the X and Y axis or along whatever axis you choose with the stretch mode property uh, to fit the screen. The stretch mode property here allows you to stretch the movie either both left and right and up and down or either left right only or up and down only. The end movie action allows you to determine what happens to this movie once E prime is done playing it. You can either terminate the movie display object and move on to the next object in the experimental timeline or jump to whatever point you'd like. The display name property allows you to determine what display is being used to display this movie. This is especially helpful if you have more than one monitor. The line horizontal and line vertical properties allows you to determine where the movie is played in relation to the entirety of the screen. And the clear after allows you to determine whether or not this movie object is going to completely clear once it's off the screen or if we're just going to draw things over top of it. This is mostly a legacy function and we don't really need to set this. The comment tab allows you to uh, give a general name to the object if it has a tag and if you have any notes associated with it. The generate pre-run and generate post-run should be set to inherent, but if you would like this movie object to be loaded at the top of procedure, for example, to minimize any onset delay, you can definitely set that here. And this little checkbox lets you determine if this handles a conditional exit, so if people can exit out of this object while it's in the middle of running. The frame object allows you to determine how much of the screen and where on the screen this movie object is being displayed. So the height and width property allow you to determine whether or not this takes up the entirety of the screen or only a small portion of the screen. This could either be percentages or exact pixels of the screen. The position, both X and Y, allow you to set where this is being displayed on the screen. It is centered by default, so the video will display in the exact middle of the screen. You can also choose left and right, choose percentages, and you can even input pixel values and attribute references here as well. The X line and Y line allow you to determine where this X and Y property is focusing. So right now it's currently set on the center and the X and Y property is set on center. So the very center of the movie will be in the center of the screen. However, if we were to set X and Y aligned to left and top, the top left hand corner of the movie would actually now be in the center of the screen. We generally find that most users find it easier to just work with center and center for X and Y align. And then the border color and border width allow you to determine if there is a border, how many pixels wide that border is and what color it is. 
The duration input tablet allows to determine how long the movie display is going to be displayed on the screen. Is there data logging associated with it? What the timing mode is, so is it event, cumulative, or custom? And if there is pre-release, how long is the pre-release on that object? The input mask section down here allows you to set an input mask or a device through which participants are responding during this movie. If I select a device, you can see that the response options properties all become active now. So I have the allowable property, so what buttons can I press on the keyboard while the movie is displayed? The correct, so what are the correct buttons to press while the movie is displayed? And the time limit allows you to determine how long you can actually respond to this movie while the movie is playing. The end action lets you set what happens once you make a correct or incorrect response to this movie. And then you have the jump label. If you so choose to jump as an end action, this will let you set where you're jumping to. Next we have the task events. Task events allow you to time lock triggers or actions with different events in the experiment. So if I would like something to happen at the onset time of the movie, I would simply select movie.onset time, and then I would tell ePrime what I want to happen. So am I sending a trigger via Kronos, Parallel, Port, Serial, Port, or Socket, or am I activating some script that I wrote in my user script? The Experiment Advisor tab allows you to determine all of the Experiment Advisor statistics that are going to be logged in relation to this movie display object, specifically onset to onset statistics, onset delay statistics, and load time statistics. These are helpful if you believe that there is a delay in the movie appearing on the screen. Logging allows you to choose whatever data you would like to log for this movie. Are you logging simply time audit measures to determine how long it's been on the screen and if there are any errors associated with it? Are you logging dependent measures related to response or response accuracy? Or do you simply want data related to the movie object? So how many frames it was running, at what frame rate it was running, how many frames were dropped, when the first frame was selected, those types of data. Those are logged by default and are specific to the movie display object. And then finally, sync allows you to determine if you are syncing with the vertical blank or not, and if the onset and offset are both syncing with that vertical blank. So that is all of the properties of the movie display object. Thank you very much for watching.